Chapter 11 of Curious Myths of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curious Myths of the Middle Ages by Sabine Baring Gold. Chapter 11 Antichrist and the Pope Joan. Part 2. Stephen Blanche, in his Urbis Romae Mirabilia, says that an angel of heaven appeared to Joan before the event and asked her to choose whether she would prefer burning eternally in hell or having her confinement in public. With sense which does her credit, she chose the latter. The Protestant writers were not satisfied that the father of the unhappy baby should have been a servant. Some made him a cardinal, and others the devil himself. According to an eminent Dutch minister, it is immaterial whether the child be fathered on Satan or a monk. At all events, the former took a lively interest in the youthful Antichrist, and, on the occasion of his birth, was seen and heard fluttering overhead, crowing and chanting in an amusical voice the sibylline verses announcing the birth of the art persecutor. Papa pater patrum, papisai pandito partum, et tibi adem de corpore quando recedam, which lines, as being perhaps the only ones known to be of diabolic composition, are deserving of preservation. The reformers, in order to reconcile dates, were put to the somewhat perplexing necessity of moving Pope Joan to their own times, or else of giving to the youthful Antichrist an age of seven hundred years. It must be allowed that the accouchement of a Pope in full pontificals during a solemn procession was a prodigy not likely to occur more than once in the world's history and was certain to be of momentous import. It will be seen by the curious woodcut reproduced as frontispiece from Baptista Mantuanus that he consigned Pope Joan to the jaws of hell, notwithstanding her choice. The verses accompanying this picture are Hic pendebat ad hoc sexum mentita virile, foemina, cui triplici prigiam diadema te mitram extolebat apex, et pontificalis adulter. It need hardly be stated that the whole story of Pope Joan is fabulous, and rests on not the slightest historical foundation. It was probably a Greek invention to throw discredit on the papal hierarchy, first circulated more than two hundred years after the date of the supposed Pope. Even Martin Polonus, A.D. 1282, who is the first to give the details, does so merely on popular report. The great champions of the myth were the Protestants of the 16th century, who were thoroughly unscrupulous in distorting history and suppressing facts, so long as they could make a point. A paper war was waged upon the subject, and finally the whole story was proved conclusively to be utterly destitute of historical truth. A melancholy example of the blindness of party feeling and prejudice is seen in Mosham, who assumes the truth of the ridiculous story and gravely inserts it in his ecclesiastical history. Between Leo IV, who died 1855, and Benedict III, a woman who concealed her sex and assumed the name of John, it is said, opened her way to the pontifical throne by her learning and genius, and governed the church for a time. She is commonly called the Papist Joan. During the five subsequent centuries the witnesses to this extraordinary event are without number nor did any one, prior to the Reformation by Luther, regard the thing as either incredible or disgraceful to the Church. Such are Mosham's words, and I give them as a specimen of the credit which is due to his opinion. The ecclesiastical history he wrote is full of perversions of the plainest facts, and that, under our notice, is but one out of many. During the five centuries after her reign, he says, the witnesses to the story are innumerable, now, for two centuries there is not an allusion to be found to the events. The only passage which can be found is a universally acknowledged interpolation of the lives of the popes by Anastasius Bibliothecarius, and this interpolation is stated in the first printed edition by Busseus Mogant, 1602, to be only found in two manuscript copies. From Mariana Scotus or Sigebert de Glambourg, the story passed into other chronicles, Totti de Muervis, and generally with hesitation and an expression of doubt in its accuracy. 
Martin Polonus is the first to give the particulars, some four hundred and twenty years after the reign of the fabulous pope. Masham is false again in asserting that no one prior to the Reformation regarded the thing as either incredible or disgraceful. This is but of a piece with his malignity and disregard for truth whenever he can hit the Catholic Church hard. Bart Platina, in his Lives of the Popes, written before Luther was born, after relating the story, says, These things which I relate are popular reports, but derived from uncertain and obscure authors, which I have therefore inserted briefly and boldly, lest I should seem to omit obstinately and pertinaciously what most people assert. Thus the facts were justly doubted by Platina on the legitimate grounds that they rested on popular gossip, and not on reliable history. Marianus Scotus, the first to relate the story, died in 1086. He was a monk of St. Martin of Cologne, then of Fulda, and lastly of St. Albans at Metz. How could he have obtained reliable information, or seen documents upon which to ground the assertion? Again, his chronicle has suffered severely from interpolations in numerous places, and there is reason to believe that the Pope Joan passage is itself a late interpolation. If so, we are reduced to Sigebert de Glembourg, died in 1112, placing two centuries and a half between him and the event he records, and his chronicle may have been tampered with. The historical discrepancies are sufficiently glaring to make the story more than questionable. Leo the Fourth died on the 17th of July, 855, and Benedict the Third was consecrated on the 1st of September in the same year, so that it is impossible to insert between their pontificates a reign of two years, five months, and four days. It is, however, true that there was an anti-pope elected upon the death of Leo, at the instance of the Emperor Louis, but his name was Anastasius. This man possessed himself of the palace of the popes, and obtained the incarceration of Benedict. However, his supporters almost immediately deserted him, and Benedict assumed the pontificate. The reign of Benedict was only for two years and a half, so that Anastasius cannot be the supposed Joan, nor do we hear of any charge brought against him to the effect of his being a woman. But the stout partisans of the Pope Joan tale assert on the authority of the Annales Augustani, footnote, these annals were written in 1135, and a footnote, and some other but late authorities, that the female pope was John the Eighth, who consecrated Louis the Second of France and Adelwolf of England. Here again is confusion. Adelwolf sent Alfred to Rome in 853, and the youth received regal unction from the hands of Leo the Fourth. In 855, Adelwolf visited Rome, it is true, but was not consecrated by the existing pope, whilst Charles the Bald was anointed by John the Eighth in 875. John the Eighth was a Roman, son of Gundus, and an archdeacon of the Eternal City. He assumed the triple crown in 872, and reigned till December the 18th, 882. John took an active part in the troubles of the church under the incursions of the Saracens, and 325 letters of his are extant, addressed to the princes and prelates of his day. Any one desirous of pursuing this examination into the untenable nature of the story may find an excellent summary of the arguments used on both sides in Giseler, Lerbourg, etc., Cunningham's translation, volume 2, pages 20 and 21, or on Bayle Dictionnaire, tome 3, article Papesso. The arguments in favor of the myth may be seen in Spenheim, Exercitationes de Papa Foemina, Opera, tome 2, page 577, or in L'Enfant, Histoire de la Papesse Jeanne, Bahia, 1736, two volumes, Duodecimo. The arguments on the other side may be had in Alati e Confutatio Fabulae de Johanna Papissa, Cologne, 1645, in Lequin, Audience Christianus, tome 3, page 777, and in the pages of the Lutheran human Sulogge Dissertationum Sacrarum, tome 1, part 2, 
page 352. The final development of this extraordinary story, under the delicate fingers of the German and French Protestant controversialists, may not prove uninteresting. Joan was the daughter of an English missionary, who left England to preach the gospel to the recently converted Saxons. She was born at Engelheim, and according to different authors she was christened Agnes, Gerberta, Joanna, Margaret, Isabel, Dorothy, or Jutt. The last must have been a nickname, surely. She early distinguished herself for genius and love of letters. A young monk of Fulda, having conceived for her a violent passion, which she returned with ardor, she deserted her parents, dressed herself in male attire, and in the sacred precincts of Fulda, divided her affections between the youthful monk and the musty books of the monastic library. Not satisfied with the restraints of conventual life, nor finding the library sufficiently well provided with books of abstruse science, she eloped with her young men, and after visiting England, France, and Italy, she brought him to Athens, where she addicted herself with unflagging devotion to her literary pursuits. Wearied out by his journey, the monk expired in the arms of the blue stocking who had influenced his life for evil, and the young lady of so many alliances was for a while inconsolable. She left Athens and repaired to Rome. There she opened the school, and acquired such a reputation for learning and feigned sanctity, that, on the death of Leo the Fourth, she was unanimously elected Pope. For two years and five months, under the name of John the Eighth, she filled the papal chair with reputation, no one suspecting her sex. But having taken a fancy to one of the cardinals, by him she became pregnant. At length arrived the time of rogation processions. Whilst passing the street between the amphitheatre and St. Clement's, she was seized with violent pains, fell to the ground amidst the crowd, and, whilst her attendants ministered to her, was delivered of a son. Some say the child and mother died on the spot, some that she survived but was incarcerated, some that the child was spirited away to be the Antichrist of the last days. A marble monument representing the papist with her baby was erected on the spot, which was declared to be a curse to all ages. I have little doubt myself that Pope Joan is an impersonification of the great whore of Revelation, seated on the seven hills, and is the popular expression of the idea prevalent from the twelfth to the sixteenth centuries that the mystery of iniquity was somehow working in the papal court. The scandal of the anti-popes, the utter worldliness and pride of others, the spiritual fornication with the kings of the earth, along with the words of Revelation prophesying the advent of an adulterous woman who should rule over the imperial city, and her connection with Antichrist, crystallized into this curious myth, much as the floating uncertainty as to the signification of our Lord's words, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God, condensed into the myth of the wandering Jew. The literature connected with Antichrist is voluminous. I need only specify some of the most curious works which have appeared on the subject. St. Hippolytus and Rabanus Morris have been already alluded to. Commodianus wrote Carmen Apologeticum Adversus Gentes, which has been published by Dom Petra in his Spicilegium Solis Mense, with an introduction containing Jewish and Christian traditions relating to Antichrist. De turpissima conceptione nativitate et aliis praesagiis diabolicis, ilius turpissimi hominis antichristi, is the title of a strange little volume published by Lenoir in A.D. 1500, containing rude yet characteristic woodcuts representing the birth, life, and death of the men of sin, each picture accompanied by French verses in explanation. An equally remarkable illustrated work on Antichrist is the famous Liber de Anticristo, a block book of an early date. It is in 27 folios and is excessively rare. Dibden has reproduced three of the plates in his Bibliotheca Spenceriana, and Falkenstein has given full details of the work in his Geschichte der Buchdruckerkunst. There is an Easter miracle play of the 12th century, still extant, the subject of which is the life and death of Antichrist. 
More curious still is the Farce de l'Antéchrist et des Trois Femmes, a composition of the 16th century, when that mysterious personage occupied all grains. The farce consists in a scene at a fish stall, with three good ladies quarreling over some fish. Antichrist steps in, for no particular reason that one can see, upsets fish and fishwomen, sets them fighting, and skips off the stage. The best book on Antichrist, and that most full of learning and judgment, is Malvenda's great work in two folio volumes, De Antichristo Libri Duodecim, Lyon, 1647. For the fable of the Pope Joan, see J. L'Enfant, Histoire de la Papesse Jeanne, La Haye, 1736, two volumes, Duodecimo. Alati e Confutatio Fabulae de Johanna Papissa, Cologne, 1645. End of chapter 11